Welcome to Alectra Online, and in this video we're going to take a look at the p-orbital shapes. Now in a previous video we looked at the s-orbital shapes, and those shapes are spherically nature. In other words, the probability of the electron existing somewhere around the nucleus is in a spherical shape when we're dealing with the s-orbitals. But the p-orbitals, they're a little bit different. And so for that we need to take a look again at the quantum mechanics solutions of the Schrodinger equation. And what we're finding here is that in the phi direction and the theta direction, now what is the phi direction, theta direction, let's go back up to our drawing over here. And so in the three-dimensional world, when you want to use spherical coordinates, we use r as the distance from the, from the origin to the point in question. We use phi as the angle between the x-axis, and I might as well label these axes. So this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, this is the z-axis. So it is the... Uh, the angle from the x-axis to the point in question around the xy plane. And then we have the theta angle, which is the angle from the z-axis down to the point in question. So those are the three dimensional units, so to speak, that we use to, to explain a position in space using spherical coordinates. In those coordinates, we have a solution as to the wave equation in the phi direction in the theta direction for these specific p orbitals. Notice that when the uh, principal quantum number n is equal to 2, that means the second energy level, and L is equal to 1, which is associated to the angular momentum of the, of the electron, which is associated to the p orbitals when L is equal to 1, and then we have 3 p orbitals, which is kind of numerically associated with m sub L. This is a magnetic uh, quantum number, but there's a little, little bit of different reasons why this one exists this way, but it does seem to indicate there should be 3 orbitals, and we'll get into that in a later video. But anyway, going back to the solution of the wave equation, the Schrodinger equation, we'll see that in the phi direction for L equals 1 and M sub L equals 0, there's no dependency on the angle, but there is a dependency on the angle in the theta direction. In other words, away from the z-axis, as the angle theta gets bigger, there's a dependency of the wave function. Now, notice that if you want to calculate the probability of where the electron would be, you want to square the wave function. So the probability is equal to the wave function squared, and we're only looking at the theta direction here, so let's call it theta right here. So this would be equal to some constant, would be 6 over 4, because when we, when we square square to 6 over 2, we get 6 over 4 times a cosine square of theta. So the dependency is, is right there, it depends on the cosine of the angle. So the probability of finding an electron in the theta direction, so to speak, depends on the angle theta. Now, notice when the angle is zero, the cosine of zero is zero, that means along the z-axis we have the maximum probability of finding, the, um, of finding the electron. As the angle gets bigger, when the angle becomes 90 degrees, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero, so that means there's zero probability of finding the electron in the y direction. Then if we continue with the angle to 180 degrees, the cosine of 180 degrees is minus 1, but since we square it, we get 1 again. That means we have maximum probability to find it along the negative z direction. So we find large probability finding it here, large probability finding it here, and as the angle gets bigger, we find a smaller and smaller and smaller probability. And so that's where mathematically we come up with these lobe shapes in this direction. And so we can then say that the p orbital along the z axis must kind of look like that, simply based upon the mathematics of the solution of the Schrodinger equation. We know that in the z direction, the orbitals should look like that. But what about the x and the y direction? Do we have any dependencies there? Well, it turns out when we have m sub l plus or minus 1, we have a different solution for the, angle, for the uh, probability of finding an electron in the phi direction and in the theta direction. Notice in the theta direction, we now have dependency of the sine of theta. Why? That means we should find the maximum probability along the xy plane and the minimum probability along the z-axis. So let me use a slightly different color. So we can then say that along the plane here, and I'll draw a dashed line here for the negative y direction and here for the negative x direction. So somewhere along the xy plane, we would find the maximum probability or well, that's where we have the maximum probability of finding an electron in the xy plane when the angle of theta 
is equal to 90 degrees because the sine of 90 is 1 and so the maximum probability would be somewhere in the xy plane. But now there's also a dependency on the phi angle right here. And notice it's, it's e to the plus or minus i phi. You say, well, what do I do with that? Well, it turns out the definition of e to the i phi is equal to the cosine of phi plus i times the sine of phi. But to find the probability, we have to square that number. So let's go ahead and square that. So we have e to the 2 i phi is equal to the square of this, cosine of phi plus i times the sine of phi, the whole thing squared. And if we square that, we get the cosine square of phi plus 2 times i times the cosine of phi times the sine of phi. There should be a cosine right there. Plus i squared times the sine of square of phi. And i squared is negative 1, so actually that becomes a negative. So it's negative sine square of phi. Oh, I said phi and I wrote theta, so make it phi. Here we go. So besides having a dependency on the sine of theta, we also have the dependency on the angle phi in terms of cosine square of phi and the sine square of phi. That means that if phi is equal to, let's say, 0, the cosine of 0, that's 1, and the sine of 0 is 0. So this drops out, and this gives you a maximum value. This is an imaginary value, so we can kind of ignore that. It has no bearing on the direction of the orbitals. But you can see that on the xy plane, we would have a maximum dependency when the cosine, when the sine, when the, not the sine, but when the angle is 0, so that the cosine of 0 is 1. So the angle of 0 would be along the x-axis, and so therefore we would expect to find an orbital on the xy plane in the direction of the x-axis. Now, likewise, when the angle becomes 180 degrees, at 180 degrees, the cosine again is 1. And so on the other side, on the negative x-axis, we should also find a normal in this direction based upon that equation. And finally, we now take a look at the sine square of phi. Notice that when the angle is 90 degrees, the sine of 90 is a maximum. Since it's uh, squared, we get a positive value. Even though the minus sign is there, it simply just puts it on the other side of the... Of the um, xy plane. So if the angle is 90 degrees, we find the maximum at the minus value. So that means at 90 degrees y-axis, we would find a maximum in the negative y, so we get a lobe shape over here. So there's another orbital. And then again, when we're at 180, not 180 degrees, but at 270 degrees, we find that 270 degrees, the sine of that is a maximum value. So therefore, we have another lobe on the other side of the axis right there. And so we find that the p orbitals tend to have these lobe-shaped structures in the positive and negative z direction, positive x and y, uh, uh, positive x and negative x direction, and a positive negative y direction. Structured like that because they're dependent upon the sine of phi and the sine of theta, cosine of theta, and cosine of phi. And because of that, the orbital structure looks like that. So what do those represent, those orbital structures? They simply represent the location where you're most likely to find the electron. So those are the probability density areas of where you would find the electron around the nucleus based upon the solution to the Schrodinger equation. So if anybody ever asked you, why do p orbitals look like that? You say it simply depends upon the solution of the Schrodinger equation, which tells us that there's a dependency on the angle theta and a dependency on the angle phi. And so based upon the three-dimensional coordinates that we use in, sphere, in the, the spherical coordinates that we use, we then determine that the p orbitals need to look like that. And there you go. That's how you explain the p orbitals.